Everything up until now has been leading to this moment. IO's darling, their magnum opus, the gold standard, the unrealistic expectation setter, Hitman Blood Money. Now that Contracts was released, Eidos and IO Interactive put everything they had into making this the best game they possibly could, putting more resources into this game than any other previous title, with making a new engine from the ground up, which would allow for things like a full 360 degree motion camera to let players make their kills as cinematic as possible. And in the process, IO became the 10th largest game studio in Europe. Europe with 140 employees. With the knowledge of making the previous three games and developing Blood Money alongside contracts, this gave it the longest pre-production of any of their titles. Tor Blistad noted that because of this, they had quite a detailed level design guide so they had a good idea of what would work and what wouldn't. After reading multiple interviews from a variety of people on the dev team, the idea of a complete understanding of their IP was really apparent. When outlets would ask them how they planned to have the game play out gameplay-wise, they all had very similar answers. How the hits are executed have always been up to the player. We simply give them the tools to play as they please. One thing that really stuck out to me was in the Eurogamer interview with the game's producer, Adam Lay, who said they listened to their hardcore fanbase when designing this game. Instead of trying to appeal to as many people as possible and end up appealing to no one, they got feedback from their most dedicated fans on various forms and message boards, which helped influence their decisions for locations and overall game design. For example, the game director recounted how a screenshot from the game was shown online with 47 holding a gun behind his back. At this point in development, this wasn't a feature or anything. It was simply just made for a promotional image. But then they noticed how fans were speculating how this would factor into gameplay, and then they realized this was something that they needed to have, even if they had no idea how to implement it. On the topic of game design, unlike contracts, with critics complaining it had little mechanical innovation, Blood Money added a ton of features to spice up gameplay. You can now scale and interact with tons of areas in the environment, adding a lot of verticality to levels. After climbing up a hatch in an elevator, you can strangle someone from the top with your fiber wire and pull their body to the top of the elevator to hide it. You now have the ability to hide in crates and closets along with being able to store bodies in crates, but in doing so takes away your ability to hide in them. While wielding the game's plethora of small firearms, you can take people as a human shield. This makes it super easy to bring people to where you want to hide their body since you could knock them out by hitting them over the head with your gun. Unlike the previous two games, NPCs being knocked out for whatever reason stay knocked out for the entire duration of the level unless they're interacted with by a guard or another NPC. So you're no longer on that 5-7 to seven minute time limit when using the chloroform or the sedative. NPCs will now also tell you to leave restricted areas instead of just becoming instantly hostile. Melee combat is introduced so you can disarm people and bonk them over the head with items like the hammer, fire extinguisher, and screwdriver. Fighting people with your fists is still really clunky and I would not recommend doing it. Crouch and sneak mode have been combined, so when you're standing, you will crouch, and when you're moving, you will sneak. The speed of sneaking has also been increased when compared to contracts. You can now throw items to distract people, and weapons like the knife can be thrown to kill someone, but you're unable to retrieve them after this. With the introduction of throwing items and causing distractions comes the most broken item to ever be introduced to Hitman, the coin. I'm not joking either. This is the best item in your entire arsenal. In my eyes, this is the golden standard of a skill expression item. A new or low skill player may only get a limited amount of mileage out of this item, potentially forgetting it even exists or rarely finding instances where it's applicable. But a high skill player can use this item to work the game systems to its limits and take advantage of its AI. I honestly recommend watching speedruns for this game because they are so fascinating to see how players will use things like the coin to maximize their effectiveness and and break the game. Yes, you can look at it as the coin breaks the game because it admittedly does, but I wish more games had things like this. Allowing for skill expression in your game through its systems opens up a world of possibilities for the player and in turn keeps your game effectively living as long as people are interested to try to discover new tech. It's why things like character action and fighting games are so beloved. This at its core is what Hitman is all about and what I love about this series, a low skill floor but a high skill ceiling. The three major systems added to this were the Accident System, the Notoriety System, and the Weapon Upgrade System. 
weapon upgrades are really straightforward. Receiving money for completing levels has made a return from Codename 47. How much you receive is based on how well you do in a level. Before each mission, you can pick what weapons you wish to bring with you for your hit. Your selection includes a silenced pistol, a submachine gun, a shotgun, an assault rifle, and a sniper. As you progress through the game, you'll be able to buy new ammo types and parts for your gun, like a better suppressor, extended mags, grips, or stocks and scopes. You can also buy miscellaneous upgrades for yourself, like better body armor, extra explosives, medicine, and a briefcase that allows you to take your sniper rifle through metal detectors. The only upgrade that has me on the fence about the whole thing is the improved lockpick upgrade. It's why I'm always hesitant to have an upgrade system like this in a stealth game, because all the upgrades do is make it so you could open locked doors faster, so you can potentially see this as the early game has to suffer so it can give you something to upgrade. But in practice, it isn't that big of a deal in this game, and it isn't as dumb as something like the upgrades in Splinter Cell Blacklist with their sneakier boot upgrades that make less sound. The new accident system allows for you to make targets look like they had died in an accident. This of course plays into how you are rated at the end of a mission. Admittedly, a lot of the time, it's just having things fall on them like chandeliers or crates being suspended in the air, but there are still a lot of rather creative ones within the game. And even if they can be rather repetitive at times, it's another avenue to experiment with gameplay to see what you can get away with with making it look like an accident. The most infamous one of these, of course, is swapping out the prop gun at the play in the mission Curtains Down. I I remember this mission being talked about for years. People who didn't even care about Hitman or stealth games at all would bring up this mission and how cool it was. The final system added was the notoriety system, and honestly, it was kind of a dud. The idea behind notoriety is that the worse you do in a mission by getting caught at a scene, getting caught committing a crime, or recorded on security cameras without destroying the evidence will lead to an increase in your notoriety, meaning that people in future levels can spot you easier through your disguises and the like. In all the years I've been playing this game, I have never noticed this actually affect gameplay in the slightest, and even if it did have a huge effect, you can easily make your notoriety go away by spending some of your reward money on stuff like hush money and the destruction of evidence. I commend them for trying trying something like this because this could lead to some interesting gameplay variety and added replayability. But to even engage with this system, it requires you to play in not a really fun way. In order to get your notoriety up, you have to play worse. You have to not be an assassin. And because of this, I often forget this mechanic is even in the game. With Hitman 3 announced for a January 2021 release, maybe they will go and give it another crack again and try to implement it better now that technology has advanced. The last thing of note they added to this game was the end of mission newspaper. This is basically a recap of what happened in the level, presented as an article for a local newspaper of current events. Yes, they are really formulaic, especially if you are consistently getting things like Silent Assassin, but I just absolutely love these. These newspapers are such a campy video game concept that you don't see anymore, especially in games that are for the most part pretty self-serious. This game has my favorite tutorial ever. Not only does it function as a regular mission, admittedly, a rather restrictive one in the context of the rest of them, but it teaches you everything you need to learn about the system mechanics and all the new things introduced that I just talked about. I remember before I ever even owned the game that this was the demo on Steam and I would play through it so many times on my parents' laptop with no more than a 20 to 50 frame average, and I loved every single second of it. I never felt like I didn't understand how any specific mechanic worked after finishing this tutorial. Originally, when this game was being made as Hitman 3, the story was supposed to be a parody of the George Bush election campaign, and having the game released in 2004, it would have been perfectly timed. But as we know how things played out, contracts came out in 2004 in its place and Hitman 3 was transformed into Hitman Blood Money as it was being developed alongside contracts. So this story was shifted to the vice president attempting a coup with the help of a rival agency called The Franchise, led by the former director of the FBI. Also like contracts, the story is told via flashbacks, but this time around it's from the perspective of the former FBI director to a reporter. It's pretty funny to see how he stretches the truth at times to suit his own narrative to downplay how much of a perfect Killer 47 is due to being a clone. Who actually killed him? That's the most delicious irony of all. He stumbled coming over the compound wall, severed his spinal cord on the rocks, 
the world's most nefarious assassin died of clumsiness. The franchise's goal is to wipe out the ICA and destroy 47, so no one can possibly use his DNA blueprint to make their own army of clones, similar to the Agent 48 line that you fought at the end of Codename 47. Since the president is pro-cloning, he also has to go, and the whole reason for the interview with the journalist is to sway the public's opinion against the use of cloning and to get it outlawed. Like I mentioned earlier, thanks to how the development panned out, and with the prior knowledge of making three previous games, they had a pretty concrete and thorough level design guide. While this is still one of my favorite games of all time, up there with Ratchet and Clank going Commando and Nier, I fear this game's age is starting to show. The level House of Cards was really starting to get under my skin during this playthrough. It's not even that bad of a level. There is a decent amount of things to do and places to explore in the casino hotel, but this level just takes forever to do anything in it, since two of the three targets aren't in the level at the start and you have to wait for them to arrive. It takes up to 10 plus minutes for the final target to even arrive, which then prompts the second target to leave the bar. Until then, you can just be stuck with nothing to do and just aimlessly walk around. If someone made a mod to make Al Khalifa either start in the level or show up much sooner, this would be a far better level. The other thing that makes this game really start to show its age in this playthrough is I ran into a lot of technical issues that I've never had before. Animations would break while walking, causing me to lose speed and would result in me just gliding downstairs. If I tried to crouch during this, it would cause horrible screen tearing. Recording won't even pick up half of how bad it is. In the mission Flatline, you're supposed to inject Agent Smith with a serum to make it look like he dies, so they'll take his body to a morgue and you can bust him out. For some reason, the AI just freaked out and glitched, so when they were supposed to take his body from the underground facility to the morgue by the exit, they just didn't do it for 20 minutes. I had nothing to do, and I was effectively trapped in the level. Another bug was that I kept running into invisible walls in Death on the Mississippi. So not only is this my least favorite level in the game, wishing that I could rip it out and replace it with one of the original levels from Contracts, but then I couldn't even do the normal strat to get Silent Assassin on this level. The worst bug of all I ran into while recording is in the final level. The last place you want to run into a game-breaking bug is the climax of your game. During 47's funeral, there is supposed to be a Gaussian blur over the background. But not only was it gone, but the mouse cursor was stuck on my screen. And originally, I wasn't able to wake 47 up no matter how hard I mashed. Without V-Sync on, half the time I couldn't get him out of the casket. I didn't run into any of these issues the last time I played the game, which had been only a year prior, but it was on an older PC, so I fear that it's starting to get the old game on a new PC bugginess, which I never had up until this point. At least Hitman has a dedicated fanbase, and if issues start to make the game completely unplayable, hopefully people will make fixes, or by some miracle IO would release a patch, but that seems really unlikely. When Blood Money came out, it really felt like a game changer, bringing tons of new people into the series. Unlike contracts, iOS reported to GameSpot that it exceeded their expectations, selling 1.5 million units just in the first two months of its release. Jesper Kidd's soundtrack was nominated for Best Video Game Music at the MTV Music Awards in 2006, only losing out to Oblivion. Tor Blistad remarked that it was a happy accident that Ava Maria was even in the game, as it wasn't even part of the OST, yet ironically enough, it has become the most iconic and synonymous song with Hitman. The game would go on to receive plenty of glowing reviews from publications, with it currently sitting at an 81 for the Xbox original, an 82 for the Xbox 360 and PC, and an 83 for the PlayStation 2, with many praising the game's music and level design. But Jacob Anderson's suspicions were starting to realize, with people getting tired of Hitman. With this being the fourth game in six years, IO wanted to take a break, and like the ending of this game, the curtains closed on the story of Hitman and 47 for a while. Io would then move on to explore other avenues, releasing games like Mini Ninja and Kanan Lynch Deadman. It wouldn't be for another six years before the unrealistic expectations set by Blood Money would be inevitably let down with the divisive release of Hitman Absolution. If you've made it this far into the video, I just want to say thanks for watching as always. If you really liked this one, I ask please share it around, because these videos don't get a lot of views, and come back next week for the release of the Hitman Absolution video. If you really like the channel and want to support it more, maybe become a patron on Patreon. All patrons get access to my videos a day early, and now I'm going to shout out my $5 and up patrons who really help support the channel. Bully, Tristan the White Wolf, Filthyfinger69, Clivermort, Fies, William Moore, Mr. Kill Jr., 
Tyler Scherzer, Some Panda, Poke Joke S, Joshua DeLarino, Jachomatrius, Sarah Chan, Ben Johnson, Oods of Nudes, Fish Kami, Joan Eisen, Alejandro Benitez, Star Fox, Flarboo, and Mitchell. Thanks so much, guys. And if you want to keep up to date with what I'm working on next, follow me on Twitter. If you're a card game player of any kind, I have a TCG player affiliate link in the description below. All purchases made with my link give me a small kickback, so that's just another avenue to help support the channel. I have completed all the episodes of the Hitman Retrospective. It's just going to be uploaded once a week for the next month, so I'm not really sure what I'm going to do next. I'm kind of torn right now between doing a Kill the Past video covering all of Suda51's games prior to the release of No More Heroes with the lead up to No More Heroes 3, or maybe cover the Ratchet and Clank Future Trilogy, or work on the next episode of the Yakuza Retrospective with Yakuza 2 and Kuwami 2. But whatever may be next, I hope you enjoy it. And as always, thanks for watching, and see you next time.